Thanks very much, Anna, and uh, um, thanks very much to Beacon for organising this event. Um, it's amazing to see so many um, people all together, um, familiar faces, but also lots of new faces to meet as well. Um, and thanks very much for inviting me um, to talk about uh, this topic. Um, I'll start off just by... Um, the Genetic Alliance UK is the um, umbrella group for everyone living with rare genetic and undiagnosed conditions. We've got... Um, 235 members as of the last count, and I see some of you in the room today. Um, we also run the Rare Disease UK campaign, and we run SWAN UK, which is a support network for people living with undiagnosed conditions. Um, and I want to acknowledge that our work is because of our members and facilitated and powered by our membership, so we can't really do anything without our members. We're standing on your shoulders there. Um, and also, of the the community of people living with rare conditions. Also, it, at the beginning of this talk, I want to be really clear that we use the language of uh, people living with rare conditions. That's how Genetic Alliance UK talks. I think that's how the community likes to talk. However, when we work in the policy space, uh, politicians tend to talk about patients living with uh, rare diseases. So I'm going to say that quite often. And it's not my preference, but that's um, what we're going to be talking about. Um, and I think it's important also, before diving into um, policy and public affairs in, in the rare world, to acknowledge that actually probably most people living with the rare conditions, most urgent problem isn't necessarily going to be solved by pure rare condition policy. So... Um, I don't know if Metabolic Support UK are in, in the room, but uh, with um, some of our other members as well, they've been working on the cost of living crisis, which is crucial and um, one of the many challenges that's amplified by having a rare condition. Um, and we know, too, um, that uh, we're struggling for people to work in the NHS. That's a general problem, um, and sometimes that feeds into... Uh, challenges for people living with rare conditions. So the workforce problem is one of the reasons why we um, aren't dealing with uh, the diagnostic odyssey as effectively as we could be at the moment. Um, so I thought, I'm not going to spend too long on this, um, but just to show you, these are the rare disease policies that my colleagues and I work on, that our community work on together. It's not all of them, um, but some of the the key things are here. Um, we've got the UK Rare Diseases Framework, which runs past the next election, um, and there are four implementation plans, and we need to work with the devolved governments um, to implement them. We've got Genome UK, which is another piece of UK-wide health policy. This is unusual because health is a devolved competence, but the four governments got together and decided they need to work together on these two topics, and their implementation plans in the four nations here as well, also stretching past the next election. Um, sometimes policies don't have quite the same kind of label as having a big title with capital letters. Sometimes it's just the stuff that important institutions do. And Genomics England, whatever they decide to work on, is actually quite a big deal and important for policy and so on. And that applies to lots and lots of arms length bodies of the government, um, and we consider that policy work. Same with the decisions as, as the genomic medicine services across the UK. Um, whether there is or isn't an NHS reorganisation is a key bit of rare condition policy. It's always destabilising, and we tend to prefer central organisation for um, rare care, especially when we're talking about specialised commissioning. Um, and there's you know, we, I think most of these topics we could spend an hour on, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, now, who are the, you know, so next next major thing for us as, as in, in the public affairs world is when there's an election, um, and uh, we're wasting a lot of time talking about that at the moment. Um, I had to hurriedly add a new slide to this presentation on Thursday because the hint that was only a few weeks ago that the elections in autumn has been replaced by a hint that it might be in spring. Um, although this weekend Jeremy Hunt expressed frustration that 
his budget looks like an election pitch. So who knows? But there will be an election at some point soon. Um, and that means that um, we'll be changing the key figures, maybe. Um, although at the rate of the current government, changing them will, <laughs> will, will definitely be changing them. I thought about doing a quiz to see who, <laughs> who could identify all six. And if anyone's really bold, um, I'd be, I can't. So uh, um, these are the names. Um, we've got a new Secretary of State for Health and we've got a new Minister for Health with responsibility for rare diseases and a new uh, Minister in um, the Science Research and Innovation Department who would look over genomics for us. And um, uh, then we've got the, the shadow team as well. Um, and these are the ones that really can influence all of those other policies that I was just looking at. Um, I think it's... I want to just dwell for a short moment on which of these actually require legislation. So primary legislation to introduce a new law in the UK. Um, and it's debatable, so uh, you, you might have a different opinion than me, but NHS reorganisation tends to require legislation. Um, and often we don't want it, as I hinted at earlier, just let's let the organisations bed down. And these are, these are two areas as well where maybe you need legislation. But actually, one of the key messages for me here is that most of what we're really interested in doesn't require a new law. And that's what a lot of people think about when they think about working with um, parliamentarians. Let's ask them to pass a law to fix it. And actually, that's... We don't do it very often in the UK in our space. Other countries do. Italy made a lot of progress with uh, rare condition screening by just passing a law to say we need to screen um, for a number of conditions, and that did, uh, did change things. But in general, you'd rather that an expert makes decisions about the future of policy rather than someone who's a generalist. Uh, MPs and peers are great. Um, in the House of Lords, you sometimes do get specialists but they tend to be a little bit behind the uh, cutting edge um, in the House of Lords. Um, and before I move on, I just want to... I've been talking about policy a lot. Um, I have, I, actually, I'm supposed to be talking about public affairs. So just to define public affairs very briefly, and there's lots and lots of definitions, but the, the definition I would use is, is policy is ideas um, and public affairs is people and relationships. So these are the people that can actually implement the ideas and make changes. Um, the previous slide where I had my gallery of um, ministers and so on are all responsible for getting all of this done. Um, but we can't necessarily always talk to them. It's quite difficult. So we need our, our um, supporters to um, help us hold them to account to deliver the policies that are important to us. So this is an example of a set of um, rare condition champions. There are many more in Parliament um, around the UK. Um, these are some of the ones that our members have worked with, that we've worked with, um, and uh, they've all contributed in different ways to making sure that either the minister's responsible for delivering rare condition policy um, have been held to account or for delivering new bits of rare condition policy or speaking up in the House of Commons, in the House of Lords, um, to defend issues around rare conditions and push. Um, so uh, I think we'll all recognise someone on that slide, hopefully. I think the, hope, the presentation today is called The Future of, um, of Rare Condition um, Public Affairs. And I think the key message for, for me to you, with so many people here today, is I would like to be able to do a slide here where the pictures are so small you can't see the faces. And we at Genetic Alliance UK can't do that by ourselves. We, all of these people haven't been recruited by us. They've been recruited by someone living with a rare condition, going to speak to um, their parliamentarian and forming a relationship. And then we've shared that relationship with 
with um, the person living with a rare condition. Um, so just pick an example. Um, second from the uh, your left on the bottom is Baroness Pauline Neville Jones, um, and uh, she uh, is from Unique. So um, Unique have uh, helped us work with her, um, and these people do this for us. So there's lots of things here. You can have um, events and so on, and um, work with them to. Uh, have a meeting with the minister, if something's wrong, you need to interrupt them and um, tell them uh, to, to work differently. You can host events in Parliament, which brings in much more um, advocates and so on. Um, asking parliamentary questions is really important. We asked one recently about rare disease alert cards. Normally you get a very boring answer, but um, this time we got the answer. NHS England has no plans to work on this, um, which is kind of an open door to develop that bit of policy. Um, right, so how do you actually engage with your parliamentarian? Um, we've got tools on our website to help you write to them. Um, there are links here. I hope Flip Beacon will be sharing these slides. Um, but it's quite, they should be bothering you at the moment to have conversations because they all want to be elected again. So you can go along to those meetings and tell them that you're living with a rare condition, tell them you've got priorities. It's always good to have a reason to go to them, so it's a, an actual request. And if you have so many ideas you're struggling to prioritise, then we can help. Um, you can also attend the meetings that we organise and go, uh, before you go, tell them you're coming and then they'll come because they don't want to have the embarrassment of you being in Parliament and them not seeing you there. And we can help with that as well. Um, how do we recruit more? We run the Rally for Rare campaign. Um, this happens around elections, and this is where we engage um, prospective parliamentary ca candidates and ask them to support our messages as they um, campaign. Um, hopefully they sign a pledge and then we share them on social media, and then their competitors see they've been shared on social media and also sign the pledge and they get shared, and that does tend to grow the voice. Um, these are the pledges we did in 2021 in the local, in the devolved nation elections. Um, and there you can see they're quite general. Um, hopefully these are non, not too specific that parliamentarians won't sign them, but they're specific enough that we can then hold them to account once they're elected. Um, and we put, put, put together these um, graphics, um, my colleagues put together these graphics, and you can use these. Um, and this is uh, an example of a member of the Senate using our graphics. Um, and he is now a member of the cross-party group um, in Wales. Um, cross-party groups are where these parliamentarians get together and organise themselves. And we provide the secretariat for the ones in Scotland, Westminster and Wales. And the Northern Ireland Rare Disease Partnership provide a secretariat for the same in Northern Ireland. There's loads of them. Um, you can see some of the rare condition ones here. I think there are actually more uh, APPGs than there are um, MPs. Um, so the new rules mean we're going to cut them down. All of the country ones are likely to go because uh, foreign governments can't fund them anymore. Um, and there are different rules around membership and chairmanship, which means we're talking to uh, some of the APPGs for specific rare conditions to see how we can fold together that activity, strengthen our group, and make sure that that voice carries on. Um, and uh, we, uh, will, we're very happy to speak to the secretariats of those that we haven't yet spoken to. So... Um, I think it's really important that we try to hold on to the UK rare diseases framework as we come up to an election. We hold on to Genome UK as we come up to an election. Um, and in this opportunity, let's try and recruit as many new <coughs> rare condition advocates as we can um, going forward. My colleague, Rachel, is um, going to uh, be very happy to hear from all of you. Um, and I wasn't supposed to talk about Rare Disease Day, but it is only 94 days away, and that's a really good opportunity to raise awareness, tell your parliamentarian, and so on. So thanks very much for inviting me here today. I'm done.